Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Turn with me over to Romans, the 12th chapter. You know, if I had to pick a few scriptures out of the Bible, uh, these scriptures, and most of you know they're my favorite scriptures. I preach on them a lot. But you know, I've seen this area of scripture in so many different ways that I don't think I'll ever stop preaching on them. I don't think I'll ever stop teaching, stop teaching out of them because they're foundational scriptures. If you understand the principles of these scriptures, uh, your life will radically change. My life has radically changed every time I apply these scriptures to my life. And here in Romans, the 12th chapter, the first verse, it says, I beseech you, therefore, <coughs> brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Say living. living. You know, it's really interesting about that word living. You know, God, when, when Jesus gave himself as a living sacrifice, he gave, himself, he gave himself as an example to us. That Jesus yielded to the Father's will in his life, and by him yielding to the Father's will in his life, life came back to him. See, people want to want God to give them his life, but they, a lot of times they don't want to give God their lives. Yeah, come on. They want to give God their problems. They want to give God their, uh, their uh, struggles. They want to give God their addictions. They want to give God their finances. They want to, you know, and when I say give God their finances, I'm talking about their debts. God, take over my finances. Here they are. And you're up to here in debt and stressed out. And now you want God to have your finances. You know, you should have wanted God to have your finances before you got yourself in the mess you're in. Yeah. But that's a, I'm not taking the offering, so I'm receiving the offering. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when, when you give yourself as a living sacrifice to God, He's going to pour His life in your life. Yeah. It's called the Zoe life of God. God's very essence, His, his vitality. I tell you what, I've been seeking God for his vitality. Yeah. Because I don't know about you, you, I don't know about you, but I get weary sometimes. <laughs> you know, I you know, it just seems like day after day after day and situation after situation, and sometimes you can just get weary. But when you the Bible says over in Isaiah that those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up with eagles. You know, and, and so in the whole concept, God has just changed my thinking concerning that verse because the word strength actually comes from the word we get the word communion from. And I've shared this before. But God showed it to me in a whole different way the other day. He, he showed me this, this strand of, of just scarlet red, just wet and sparkling, and this solid red cord. And then I saw this white cord. No color, no, nothing, nothing spectacular about it. Just this white cord. And I saw that red cord and the white cord begin to wrap or intertwine. They that wait upon the Lord. That means to intertwine with. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew his strength. And like a chameleon will crawl up against a red flower, it turns red. But if it crawls up against a leaf, it turns green. Whatever it is in contact with, it takes on that appearance. And see, I saw myself as that white cord, and as I wrapped myself up in God, as I intertwined with Him, His color, His radiance, His, His, uh, His majesty, all that He is begin to, begin to, begin to uh, bleed into me. And I look just like him. And I'm telling you, there's something about presenting yourself as that living sacrifice on a daily basis. You just come to God and you say, here I am. Here I am. And I don't know about you, but I kind of like, I get up in the morning. I never used to be a morning person until I decided to put this verse in practice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself. I wake up every morning to present myself to God. Amen. I'll tell you what, it'll keep you clean, too. <laughs> because sometimes I go in there and I say, here I am! Yeah. And he says, uh, we need to talk about your attitude the other day. You know, it's like, oh, God. <laughs> but, you know, he begin to, you know, I find sometimes he talks about me to me. 
And sometimes he talks about him to me. Oh, I love those times. Don't you love those times when God starts showing you who he is to you? I love those times. And other times he takes me over to my prayer assignments. I have prayer assignments. There are certain things and certain people I pray about as often as I think about them. And because they're assignments. They're just not something that, oh, I think I'll pray for Sister So-and-so today. Or I'll pray for President. No, they're prayer assignments. And you know what I'm talking about, prayer assignments. God gives you something you just can't get up. In old time Pentecost, it says he laid a burden on you. <laughs> he just put a burden on you. Well, I understand what they're saying, but that kind of got out of context in some cases. But just that prompting in your heart to just stay on something until you feel that release yeah. about it. And then, and then sometimes we go to the Word, and he just opens up the Word to me. But I tell you, I found that when I present myself to him every day, as to what I start saying, I never used to be a morning person. I mean, if you tried to talk to me before 8 o'clock, you're taking your life in your hands. <laughs> I just is not a morning person. But I find I'm up at 6 o'clock. I mean, that's two hours before. And I'm not usually through with this to have breakfast till sometime 9 o'clock. Because it's so rich to spend time with God, the creator of heaven and earth. Oh my goodness, how wonderful that Amen. is. You know, I don't have to pray. I get to pray. Amen. I don't have to meet with God every day. I get to meet with God every day. It's not a chore. If your prayer time is a chore, you're approaching it totally wrong. Amen. But when you present yourself as a living sacrifice. Now listen to this. I love it. Holy and acceptable unto God. You know, you're, you're, God looks at you holy. Amen. You know, he got on me here the other day um, about calling something that he was saying. In fact, I was praying about California. And I, you know, I was saying, God, you know, and I was just, you know, going after California. You know, the crooked politicians and the, you know, <laughs> just going after, going after California. And uh, I said, God, what do you say? I should have asked him that first. <laughs> I said, what do you say about California? And he said, he took me over to um, Acts the ninth chapter. Ninth, tenth chapter was about Cornelius. And remember when the, when the sheep came down before, Pe before Peter and, and all these animals and birds and things were on it? And, and the Spirit of God said, kill and eat. And Peter says, oh, no, I, I won't eat anything that's common. And, and the Spirit of God said to him, don't call anything that I call holy, common, or defiled. And he says, that's what I say about California. He says, I call it holy. Amen. And I went, woo, forgive me, God. <laughs> you know? And I tell you, it's, it's changed the way I think about California. See, God's Word will do that. We'll read that in a second verse here. But God's Word will change your thinking. And I don't know about you, but I've had some pretty stinky thinking. Yeah. You know, because of life's experiences and, you know, things that go on and people and things and, you know, world history and you name it. You know, you can get some pretty stinky thinking going on in your life. Well, it's always been that way and it'll always be that way. No, that's not what the Bible says. See, when you renew your mind, somebody says, oh, so and so's. Oh, their, their family's been that way and they'll always be that way. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, because the things that are seen, what you're seeing right now, is temporal. It's subject to change. But the things that are unseen are eternal. When, when, I, look at, when I look at a relative that's acting like the devil, I quote that scripture. I'm not going to look at what I see. I don't care how many generations that goes back. I know what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that there's nothing impossible with God. And that it's God's will that every man be saved. So that's what I'm going to say over that person. And that generational thing's quitting right here with this person in Jesus' name. I, I talk to my family like that a lot. <laughs> you know, I talk to those that, you know, that once knew the Lord and don't. I, I call them that. I don't care what's happened in your life. I don't care how offended you are in Jesus. I don't say that to them. <laughs> I say that to the devil that's controlling their mind. You know, I don't care. I'm telling you right here, right now, your job's over. I release you from your assignment. 
And I command you to go in Jesus' name. Right. You know? And you, you speak the eternal truth over to your situations in your life, not what you see. Right. I'm not saying just ignore things and live with your head in the clouds. But what I'm saying is don't give what's happening power over the Word of God. Right. You take the Word of God and give the Word of God power over the circumstance. Amen? Amen? That's what faith is all about. And so he's saying here, he says... He says that, uh, that you're holy and acceptable. That's what I was getting at. You're holy and acceptable. Don't take what anybody or anything else says about you. Oh, you, you, God's not going to heal you. You don't deserve that. No, I'm holy and I'm acceptable right. unto God. I will not defile. I will not call what God has called holy unholy in Jesus' name. Amen. God just called you holy. You're holy and you're acceptable to Him. And so when, when we take the Word of God and we begin to recreate our thinking, we stop thinking the stinking thinking and we start thinking the Word thinking and we begin to change our mind, circumstances begin to change around us. And so he, he says here that you're holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Otherwise, presenting yourself to God is only reasonable. I mean, if he's your God and you're serving him, it's only reasonable that you present yourself to him every day. You know, you, you work at Walmart, it's only reasonable that you show up and present yourself if you're to be there at 8.30 in the morning or whatever. You know, it's only reasonable that you show up. Well, you know, you're the servant of the Most High God. You're the child of a living God. You're the child of the Creator of heaven and earth. It's only reasonable that you present yourself to Him every day. Amen. And it's by His mercies that you can do that. And it says here, and do not be conformed. So the, the, the first thing that needs to happen is, one, you need to commit yourself to God on a daily basis. You present yourself to God on a daily basis, and then you allow the Word to change your thought process. Because it says here, it says, and do not be conformed. That word conform means to be pressed into a mold. You know, God's got a plan for you, and the devil's got a fake for you. God's got a mold for you. <laughs> And the devil's got a mold for you. Amen. And the devil's mold is full of stealing, killing, and destroying. And God's mold is full of success and full of the destiny of God for your life. Right. And, and you can, if, if you're going to live in a world that you're going to live by just what you see, oh, the taxes are raising. Do you serve a God that can meet your all your needs? Yes. The gas prices are going up. Do you serve a God that can meet all your needs? Yes. You, you can gripe and complain about the, the gas taxes that just went in, just getting ready to come into effect. I mean, I can really get worked up over it if you want to be real frank. And I have in some cases. Uh, but what does my getting worked up do to the circumstance? Nothing. It just makes me miserable and everybody around me miserable because all I'm doing is griping and complaining and groaning and moaning about prices. <laughs> and what I need to be doing is hearing what God says. See, because he says you can be conformed to this world. You can be like everybody else on the face of this world and gripe and complain about how life is going. Or you can, you can be what God says to be and that's to be more than a conqueror. That's to be a person that lives in victory. That's a person that lives in faith. A person that lives in peace, joy, righteousness. You, know, you can be that. You can choose. See, it's your choice. I, I'm telling you what. I come from the from the class A one form of griping and complaining in my family. I mean, my oh my goodness. My family, not so much my dad's side, but my mom, my mom's mom's side, my grandpa's side, they, they're sweet people. But my grandma, my grandma would get mad at my grandpa. We'd be sitting at the dinner table, and she'd go, Karen, pass your, pass your grandfather the potatoes. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know and she, she'd be mad at him, and she'd gripe and complain, and, and she taught that to her children, and they griped and complained. And they taught it to their children. 
for me, moi. Gripe and complain, criticize. Gripe and complain. You know, every place you go. And, and you know, God started getting on, he started using this verse to renew my mind. And he's still working on me, praise God. I'm not as bad as I used to be. I gave pastor permission. <laughs> Uh, to, to let me know if I was getting over in that. He'd say, Karen, you've already expressed your opinion about that. You know? And I used to get mad at him for doing it, even though I asked him to do it. But now I'm glad he does, because I begin to realize just how bad I was. And we don't hear ourselves a whole lot, but everybody else hears us. You know? And so, so God began to take this word, and he began to say, you know, why aren't you saying what I'm saying? And I said, well, I don't know what you're saying. He says, well, then ask me. And so that's why I asked him about California that day. I was griping and complaining. I was in the throne room griping and complaining. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and finally I said, God, forgive me. I realized what I was doing. I said, forgive me. I said, what do you say about California? And he said, I call it holy and I call it righteous unto me. I said, boy, it sure don't look like that to me. <laughs> he says, because you're not seeing it like I do. And I said, God, then help me see it like you do. Yeah. And you know, he began to show me. One morning he showed me, he, he, he began to talk to me about, about California. And I began to write it down because it was just so powerful. But he, but he showed just this pile of, of dirt and debris and garbage. And, and I knew it was California. And I you know, thinking to myself, yeah, that's California, you know. And God says, but watch this. And just the wind of the spirit began to blow. And that debris began, garbage began to blow off. And before I knew it, the whole state was glistening like a topaz. Just this beautiful gold and jewel. And began to glisten and the facets on it. You can't imagine the, the glory of God shining on the facets that was on this jewel called California. And I said, oh, God, I'll never gripe about California again. But, of course, you know. <laughs> when you're in the presence of God, you say all kinds of things. <laughs> then you get back into humanity and you just, you know, you become human. But, you know, I begin to, I begin to just see what God was seeing in California. And I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, oh, Jesus. I mean, it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. I can't even explain in English words, Spanish, German, or anything else, <laughs> what I saw, the beauty of what I saw. And see, that's what God sees. You know, you start asking him about people. You start asking him about family members that just really get on your last nerve. <laughs> you know, People, I'm telling you what. You know, we were, Pastor and I were talking about a, a, a person, not gossiping. We were talking about a person. And, uh, and I said, you know, I, I really felt like God, they're not here anymore, but I really felt like God had put them with us because we had some things to deposit in them, but they just couldn't get it. I don't know, if you just this particular person, just, it's like they just couldn't get it. They'd shake their head and say, yes, 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 and then they'd never change. You know, and you're going... Sometimes as a pastor, that's kind of frustrating. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, we were, but he, and pastor said to me, he says, well, Karen, he says, you're all, you were always giving excuses for that person. And I said, because I was giving them the benefit of the doubt. I said, I love them, and I've given them the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, God gives you the benefit of the doubt a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. You know, because he knows who he made you to be. Amen. He knows who he created you to be. You're not there yet. I'm not there yet. Amen. He's created us to be so much of like that, like that, the facets on that, that jewel I saw California. That's how God sees you. There's so many facets about you that you don't even know about yet. But God's polishing us. God's working on us. And as we let the word of God, it says, and do not be conformed or molded into the world, but be transformed. Form. I love that word transformed. It's metamorphous. We get the word metamorphous out of it. Where a caterpillar, you know, cocoons itself and it becomes a butterfly. It's no longer subject to just the ground. 
it can soar. Mm. You know, it's unlimited now where it can go. And see, that's what you are. You are, you are, when you came to God, you were just a caterpillar on the earth. And all you could do is, is do what the earth dictated to you. But when you received Jesus, he cocooned you in his love. Mm. And, and you were born again to an unlimited being. Now, I realize we're limited to our bodies. Well, I can't even say that because God can translate you. <laughs> you know, we're, we, we serve an unlimited God that's caused our being to be unlimited. You know, when we serve Him and obey Him. And so He's saying here, He says, don't, don't just hang out in the earth. Don't just stay in contact with the earth. He said, but let my word do something in you that causes you to be greater and higher than you could ever be on yourself, in yourself. And he says here, he says, and be, not, and be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. By the word of God. By the renewing of your mind. See, when you let your mind be renewed by the word of God, it takes the limits off of what you can do and be. There's no limit in God. If, 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 he, if he says, uh, you know, I, I remember as, as a teenager when, when Pastor and I were dating, uh, my mom always, always trained me that when I dated somebody to hear what God said about that somebody before I made any kind of commitment to them. And so, so when I could see that Pastor's and my relationship was getting serious, I went to God and I said, what about him? What about, what, who is he, God? And I saw him standing behind a pulpit. Wow. I was 15 years old. Wow. And I saw him standing behind a pulpit. And he says, that's where your life will be if you go with him. And I knew, because I knew ministry was in my life. And I, and I saw him behind a pulpit. And I knew that. And, and so I began to talk, you know, Pastor, I began to talk about that. And, and he says, yeah, he says, I felt like, you know, I've had a call of God on my life. And, you know, we started to make plans, you know, in that direction. And, uh, and then, of course, we got married in the cares of this world. And we were being conformed to this world <coughs> and not, you know, we, we didn't know a whole lot, you know, spiritual things. I mean, we knew foundations. We knew we were saved. We could speak in other tongues and, you know. And, uh, but, you know... What happened is because we didn't allow our minds to be renewed, we just begin to do what we could do in the natural. I'll tell you what, you can't do a whole lot in the natural. But when you begin to let the Word of God renew your mind and you begin to see who God says you are, you know, sometimes your brain won't even accept what God's telling you because of the way you think. I don't care how many years I've heard God loves you. And I don't care how many years, I can't tell you how many years I've heard God say, I love you. And it was, it was, it was legal. Jesus, you know, loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. It was legal. I, I understood it. But until I begin to get to know him, and, and, and every year that passed as I got to know him more and more and more, I begin to really believe God yes. loves me. Yes. He really loves me. I'm a daddy's girl. That's right. I'm Amen. special in his eyes. Amen. It gives him great pleasure Amen. to meet my needs. Amen. To satisfy yes. my yes, needs. See, several years ago, I, be, I began to go see a psychiatrist. A, a psychiatrist psychologist. And one of them, psycho one of them. <laughs> and, uh, because uh, that's the way I felt. But, you know, one of the questions she asked me when I first started seeing her was, what do you like about yourself? Now, that might seem an easy question to you. But it was a hard question for me. And I thought, and I thought, and mind you, this has only been maybe 15, less than 15 years ago. And I finally said, nothing. And she says, oh, Karen, there's got to be something that you like about you. you no. Know? 
I don't, I don't like me at all. And uh, nothing about me that I like. And uh, she said, no, you think about it. So I thought of Ellie Warner. I thought, well, she can, she can let me think. She's getting paid by the hour. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, I better think of something real quick here. And I, uh, I finally says, well, if you're my friend, you're my friend. I got your back. I'm loyal. She says, okay, let's start there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it might be hard. Sometimes when God says, says, I feel, Holly, I love you. You go, I know, but did you see what I did yesterday? God, surely you saw that attitude I caught the other day. Sometimes our brain just won't let God love us. Our brain can be a really good thing, or our, thing, our brain can be a really bad thing. Yeah, Depends on how we've allowed it to be programmed. Your brain is nothing but a meat computer. <laughs> you've, got, you've got a part of your brain back here that's like a hard drive in a computer. And things stay back there. And uh, sometimes I would respond something when I was in these sessions. She'd go, whose voice did you hear when you said that? My, my mother's voice. <coughs> yeah. you know, because those things, that's why I tell young mothers all the time, when your baby's born, it's coming out like a clean whiteboard. Be careful what you write on it. Because it is an erasable ink you write on it. Your words are not erasable ink. I heard this illustration once. This man handed this boy a plate and said, break it. So the boy broke it. He was trying to teach him a lesson on forgiveness. And the boy broke it. And the man said, now pick it back up and put it all back together again. He said, well, I can't do that. It's broke. And he says, that's the way your words are. You can say you're sorry all you want, but the damage has been done. Mm -hmm. And so and it, and you can't put it, you can put it back together. You can glue it back together, but it still ain't right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you know, I, I'm always telling young mothers, you mothers, you know, be careful what you write on your baby's heart because it's, it stays with them. Yes, it does. And, um, and so, you know, when, when, when we come to God, we present ourselves to God like this and we begin to let him renew our mind. It's like I was talking about this morning about renovation. I was talking about demolition and renovation. Amen. You know, God starts saying, I'm going to heal your, I'm going to heal your brain. I'm going to get rid of all the stinking thinking. Or like he told Pastor one day, he says, I'm going to rip fear out of you. And Pastor said, all that sounded to him like, that's, that sounds like it's going to hurt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, so God comes to you and says, he says, this is the life I want to give you, but we're going to have to change your thinking. You're going, woohoo, I like that life, God. I like what you're going to do in my life. And then he starts tearing oh. stuff out. Then he starts working on it. I'll tell you what, I've got to where I love correction. <laughs> I love correction. I even like it when Papa spanks me sometimes. Because I know he loves me and he's doing it like you used to tell your kids. I'm spanking you for your good <laughs> because I love you. And you're thinking, man, you must love me a lot. <laughs> I used to think that about my mom. Man, you must love me a lot. But, uh, you know, even, even, God's, even God's chastisement. The Bible says that he only chastises those that he loves. Yeah. And there's sometimes I really feel loved. <laughs> you know, I feel like he's working me over. But, you know, he's, he's tearing out, and that's what it says here, it says, by the renewing of your mind, he's renovating, he's tearing out the old. You know, God can actually cause you to forget some things. Yeah. It's not that you, how do I want to put it? It's not that you totally forget it, it just doesn't have the impact it used yeah. to have. Yeah. It doesn't affect you like it used to, like yeah. it used to affect you. You know, it's just like God. It says that He forgets your sins, you know, or He casts them into sin, forgetfulness, never to remember again. It's not that God has 
dementia, personality, <laughs> that, he, that he doesn't remember anymore. He chooses not to remember. Amen. He chooses not to look at your sin yes, once it's under the blood. He chooses not to focus on that. He's focused on what he's doing in your life and where he's taking you. Right. He knows what your end result is. He made you with an end result. Amen. And he knows how to get you there. And if you listen to him, he'll make the corrections he needs to make in your life. And some of them hurt. Yes. I'm telling you, some of them hurt. Yes. Amen. Because it brings back all the memories yes. and all the, the trauma of the situation. Yes. But if you give it to him, Amen. he can take that, that unholy thing and actually make it a holy thing Amen. in your life. He can make that a point. He can make that an altar in your life. He can make that a memorial stone in your life yes. to where you can remember it, but you don't remember the pain. Amen. You remember the victory yes. that's in it. You remember how good it was to be free from yes. that, that that doesn't hold me like it yes. used to hold me. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, the renewing of your mind is so important. Yes, I mean, God will give you scriptures. Yes. He'll talk to you. He'll, there's, there's times that he'll bring up scriptures in me that I don't even know where they're at. I've got to get my concordance out and find out where they're at. He'll give me those scriptures. Or he'll give me a phrase that I'll think, that's in a scripture someplace. And I, and I go look in this Bible, and there it is. And when I read it, he opens it up to me. Amen. And I see what he's saying to yes. me. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what. God can talk real loud yes. in your life. Amen. He speaks to you every day Amen. if you'll open his mouth. Amen. This is primarily how he's going to speak to you is through yes. his word. And his word is so powerful, it renovates your mind. Amen. It heals your brain. Yes. It goes to that hard drive. Yes. And this is the word he gave me this last week. Reset. Reset. Come on. Yeah. Reset. Have you ever had to push a reset button? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a power's cut off yeah. and you go in the bathroom and you push that little yeah. red reset button. Mm -hmm. you know? We're out on we, we got one out on our patio. If we gets any water near it, it flips that thing and we gotta go press press it back. Yeah. You know, you reset. If you got a, if you got a computer, I've had to go back and and reset it back to a previous date. You know, because I've done something to mess it up. You know? and so I go back and I reset it to the factory <coughs> settings. Mm -hmm. You have a factory setting. Yeah. God put a factory setting in you, and He knows how to reset it back to its original settings. Yeah. His settings. Yeah. Yeah. See, the devil gets in there and messes everything up. He puts all kinds of viruses and Trojans and everything else on your <laughs> malware on your, in your brain, yeah. in your meat computer. Yeah. But God's got the ability to press the reset button. Hallelujah. God's got the ability to take it back to its original intent. What God originally intended for your life, he can bring you right up to that through the Word of God. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Glory to God, that's good news. I thought, I thought that was good news. Yeah. Holy Ghost, divine reset. Yeah. I said reset it. Push the button, Jesus. <laughs> you know, I wish it was that easy. But he's got to have your cooperation. You've got to work with him. And he says, so let's read it again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind that you may prove or you may know you may comprehend. You may, may be one with God's thoughts. Yes. That you might know uh, or prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Yes. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied in just walking around in the good or the acceptable. Amen. I want the perfect will of God. Amen. Amen. That's my, that's my goal. That's my mark. Is the perfect will of God. Amen. Well, yeah, but you don't understand my past. And you, forget your past. God has. Yeah, come on. Your past come on. is no challenge for God's genius. Amen. Right. Amen. I don't think you got that. Yeah. Your past is no challenge for God's genius. Yeah. Right. 
God knows how to make it right. God knows how to reset back to the factory settings. Amen? Now listen, it says in verse 3, because it just doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with you doing something, you and God doing something. He doesn't do that just for you. He does that for your sphere of influence. He does that because there's people that need to be touched. It's not all about you. That's right. Even though when it's you and God, it is. Yeah. But when you step out your front door, it's not about you anymore. Amen. It's about your sphere of influence, yes. the people that God put in your pathway. It says here in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone, is, everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, now, that doesn't mean to say, well, I'm this big shot. Woo -hoo -hoo. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't think yourself in something that you're not. No. Don't think of yourself as something that, see, that's the devil's plan. That's right. Is to get you to think that you're something that you're not. Mm -hmm. Or get you to think, well, if you could be just like so-and-so, you'd be okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. You are uniquely you. There's not another one on the face of the earth like you. Amen. I would say God threw the mold away when he made you, but he didn't. It's in heaven, and you're going to have to stand up to it when you get there. Yeah. You're uniquely you. John and I both have a call of God in our life for ministry, but he doesn't minister like I do. And I don't minister like he does. Praise God. I mean, I'm not saying that bad. I'm just saying, what I, what I mean, whoops. What I mean by that is God likes diversity. And he uses diversity because I could say the same thing he says and you'll get it. Or he could say the same thing I said and you'll get it. We have ministers that come through all the time. And they get up and they preach this wonderful sermon and Pastor and I are sitting there, yeah, that's confirmation. Hallelujah, that's confirmation. Amen. And then you come up to us after service and say, did you hear what, what preacher so-and-so said? And we're both, I've been preaching that for the last six months. <laughs> but, there, but everybody has got a place yes. in your life. And, and everybody, and you receive from people that I can't receive. You, you might sit and listen to somebody and say, that's, that's the greatest preacher I've ever heard. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the dullest, most boring preacher I've ever heard. <laughs> Why? Because you're hearing what you, what is touching your life. Amen. You're hearing answers to what you're going through. Yeah. And I'm not going through it. So praise God for God's diversity. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he says, for I, uh, uh, that everyone who is among you, verse 3 again, not to think of himself more highly than not, or don't think of yourself something that you're not, but think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Amen. Now, that word dealt is really important. This is a, some cards. I'm going to give you some cards to prove the point. Don't turn them on. <laughs> Everybody has been dealt faith. Everybody got a faith card. You didn't all, but I'm not making a point. Everybody got a faith card. You've all given faith. But what that faith is for is for the gift that's in you. Turn your card over. You have faith in giving. You have faith for hospitality. You've got faith for healing. Helen's got faith. Her, she, that's where she's gifted. See, whatever you're gifted in, God's going to give you faith for. Amen. He's going to grace you. He's going to, he's going to cause that grace to cause you to function yes. in that faith. Amen. So he's not saying here that everybody's been just given faith. Right. If we finish reading the context, what you're going to, it's making a statement here that everybody has been given faith for their calling. See, I can believe God for my call. Mm -hmm. He told me a long time ago, I, you know, I, I was worried about ministering to a group of people. I knew it was going to be a large group of people, not friendly family faces, but people I didn't know. And I was kind of nervous about it. And God says, whoa, wait a minute, you're looking at this all wrong. 
he said, he says, what does my word say about the treasure of man's heart? And I said, I said, the Bible says that, uh, that there's out of the treasures of a good man's heart comes good things. And he said, you put it in, I'll pull it out. Amen. Amen. If you put the time in to hear from me and pray and, 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 and just keep the word in you, he says, when you get up to talk to people, I'll pull out what I want them to hear. Yeah. That's why I don't have a whole lot of notes. This is it. I don't have a whole lot of notes because I believe what God told me. If I put it in, he'll pull it out. Amen. And so, so, my, so I'm, he graces me for the gifts that are in me. You know, you think about some of the gifts that are in you. You've got probably more than one, but, but you usually have one. Mine is prayer. You know, I, that, that's an area I have grace and giftings in. And I enjoy that. You know, the other is teaching the Word. I, I love teaching the Word. I love sitting and talking the Word one-on-one -on -one to people. And, and, and so God will grace me. And that word grace, my favorite definition is God's ability to thrust you beyond your own abilities. Yeah. You know, God can take what little bit of pea knowledge I know and grow a plantation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, you know, he, uh, Michael always says this. He says, the Holy Ghost to make you look like a genius. Yeah. You know? And so, so God is saying here, he says, he said, I've given, he says, that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Why? And then he goes on to explain. I love the Bible explains itself. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Yeah. See, why is it important that you present yourself to God? Why is it important that you let God renew your mind? Because you've got a ministry outside yourself. That's right. You've got, a, you've got a ministry to function in. Yes. And he's dealt to every man that gift of faith or that faith to function in the grace of that calling. Amen. And that calling is for others. It's not for you. Amen. God is for you. Amen. Your time of fellowship Amen. is for you. Amen. You know, you and God together. But when you step outside your door, now you've stepped into a mission field. Now you've stepped into a field of ministry that you're going to function in that's going to make a difference. Yeah. And it says, it says here, let's read it again. For as many, uh, for we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. You know, that's why it's important that you don't tell somebody else how to do their ministry. Amen. Amen. Or you don't try to mimic your ministry after somebody else. That's right. Amen. Because that ministry over there is not yours. You don't have the faith for it. You don't have the grace for it. You don't have the giftings for it. And you will fail trying to function it. That's right. Amen. Yeah, that's right. And it says here, it says in verse 5, So we being many are one body in Christ, and individual members one of another. Now he's pulling them back together and said, said, okay, you and me, and when you and me have all have spent time together and I've graced you and favored you and, and, and anointed you to function, now you go out and you function and you're functioning out here and you're praying for people and you're laying hands on people and you're witnessing to people and you're testifying to people and you're helping people and you're giving to people. You're doing everything that you're gifted and graced to do. You're functioning in that. He turns around and he says, now, you're going to do that as a team. Amen. Amen. You're going to do that as a team. You're not doing it under yourself. You're doing it for the body of Christ. Yes. Because... We are connected one to another. Amen. And if I do my part, then Ron can come in and do his part. And then Holly can come in and do her part. And all of a sudden now we, we begin to see the will, the plan, the purpose of God being Amen. formed yes. in a church, in a community, yes. in a county, in a yes. state, in a nation. Yes. Can you imagine the power that would be generated if everybody would get in their place, yes. give their supply, yes. Do their part. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. In fact, the Bible says over in Ephesians that it causes love to expand. Yes. And when love expands, 
God gets glorified, and he'll never fail to do what he intends to do. Hallelujah. So he's saying here, he's saying, okay, spend time with me. Go out and function in what I graced you and gift you in. Come together, work together. You know, I've, I've been, you know, you know, say I've, you know, let's say I've, I've been praying for, uh, for, for Helen. Let's say I've been praying for Helen, and 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 the Lord speaks to, speaks to me and says, go connect your faith with Joanne about this situation concerning Helen. Now I don't go to Helen. I don't go to go to uh, Joanne and say, you know what Sister Helen did. Or you know what's going on, Sister? No, 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 no. I go to her and say, God, came, God told me to come to you and have you get an agreement with me about whatever God told me to get an agreement about. Yes. Now, where one can send a thousand to fly, yes. two can send ten thousand to fly. How much help now is Helen getting? Because two people are operating in the gifts and the, and the graces that God's put on their life. Yeah. See, I don't just go to anybody and ask them to pray with me or get an agreement with me. <laughs> One, I find somebody that I know will get in agreement with me, you know, and not question me. And you know what I'm saying? Because, I, you know, a lot of times when you go to people to ask them to agree with you in prayer about something or somebody, you don't need to give all the details. Well, you have a slippery slope of gossip. You know, and not only that, if, if Joanne didn't know that that was going on in Helen's life, she, she, she might stumble over it. You know, so you you got to be careful who you take your prayer request to. You know what I'm saying? Find you somebody mature and somebody that you know, keep their mouth shut and just go to the throne. And then don't give a bunch of details. Just say, Helen's struggling. And I, God said, if I, you and I just agree in that area, Amen. that God will move in her life. That's, that's all That's all Joanne needs to know. If she, she needs to know anything else, God will tell her. I don't need to tell her. I'm not Holy Ghost Junior. Amen. I stopped. I retired from that job a long time ago. <laughs> but um, but you, you see what I'm saying? We we not only function this way, we function this way, but then we function this way. We hook up. We connect one with another. I can't function without Holly. I can't I can't function without Josie. I can't function without Linda. Amen. I can't function without Paul. Amen. They're, they're this this body's important to me. Yes. It helps me fulfill what God's called me to do when you pray for me. Yes. Yes. So I, I can't separate myself from the body and think I'm going to function properly. Amen? Amen? So he says here, so, so being many, we're many and we have all these giftings and functionings and, and callings and, and, and anointings out there. He says, we are many. Uh, but we're one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Amen. Somebody hurts Tilly, they hurt me. Amen. Amen. How dare I side with somebody's opinion? Yeah. Maybe Tilly did make them mad, not Tilly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they did take offense. But it's not my job to join up with the offense and just like a can of gasoline on a fire that the devil's building to create a weapon for yeah. doing. How dare we do that in the body of Christ? I tell you, God's been getting on me about that. I, I mean, I have been really having to watch my mouth, even in just general conversation. You know, somebody might ask me about somebody that's maybe done something wrong or something. You know, my job is to say, you know, we need to keep praying for them. I had somebody say something to me this morning that uh, that would have been real easy for me to say, yeah, that's true. But instead of saying, yeah, that's true, what I said to that person, well, you know, we need to pray for that person's children and grandchildren that they don't follow the same situation. Yeah. See what I'm saying? It's real easy to get an agreement with what the devil's doing in somebody's life. Yeah, that's right. And, and we need to be conscious of the fact who are we given who are we given power to? The devil in that situation? Or are we given power to God to function and to work in that situation? Yeah. See, we need one another. I can't I can't judge I can't and understand when I when I use the word judge, 
you know, the word's going to judge them. And the Bible says judge yourself so that you won't be judged. And yeah, you know, you might see, you know, let's say somebody is out there committing adultery. And you may know that as a fact. But your job is to say what God says about that person. Yeah, you don't condone what they're doing by any means. But yet you don't damn them to hell over it either. You say, God, help them. They're on a slippery slope here. You gotta help them. They're gonna take not only take their self down, but that other person and, and their families and, and look at the harm it's gonna God help them. Amen. See, there's a big difference. That's how we function to help one another. Yeah. We give God the open heavens <laughs> to pour his power in their life and give them help. We don't, we don't say, yeah, I know, and just they're just moving from one motel to the next, you know. That, that's none of my business. That's not my place. Don't call the file what God's called holy. Amen. Especially if that person's a Christian. They need your help, not your hindrance. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. I hope I didn't muddy the water too bad. <laughs> but it says in verse 6 having then because we've said all that having then gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us let us use them you know what you're called to do you know what and, and this is how you can tell this is one easy way to know what you're called to do what's your heart's desire what does your heart desire to do if you were given all the time in the world and all the money in the world, what would your heart's desire be? Yeah. If I was given all the, I would become a hermit. You can ask Pastor. <laughs> I would become a hermit. I would have made a good monk. <laughs> because I could just I could just sit all day in the presence. I could just pray all day. In fact, I do most of the time. You just don't know I am. <laughs> because that's what I love to do. I could talk the word for 24 hours without stopping. And I will stop tonight. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what's in me. Yeah. You know? One of, the, one of the things I gave to somebody was it said giving on it. There's people who are gifted in giving. And all they do is look for opportunities to give to somebody or something. They just want to give, give, give. And you know they never give their money away. You know why? Because you can't out give God. That's right. You know? Some people are hospitality. Oh, they just they love to serve you and they love to have you at their house and they and they just they just they just love to have people around all the time. It's not me. <laughs> I'm the hermit, remember? <laughs> but there's some people that are gifted with hospitality and they love that. Mm -hmm. They love serving people. They love, you know, having people into their house. And and, 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 and when you walk in their house, it's like, ah, because the gift resides there. Yeah. Some people are gifted in, in the area of healing. And even in that, the Bible says gifts of healings. Some people are gifted with backs, to heal backs, some with brains, some with arthritis, some with diabetes. God's got diversity everywhere. That's why we need one another. Amen. You know, you may need one of us one day. Amen? Amen. He says, we have all these gifts and they are different according to the graces that's given us. Let us use them. Prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion of our faith, or our gifting, or our ministry. You know, let me kind of back up. I won't stay here real long, but you know, some people, some people have the gift of prophecy that's you know ed, just is is edifying. You know, it's a it's a, it's like a gift of edification. They just when they when they prophecy, it's just edification. You know, and and so you need to stay with that. Don't start prophesying. You know, in in different areas. I'm, I'm not really making that claim. That some people, you know, some people, some people try to prophesy, and, and it's really not prophecy, I guess, you know, into a problem, because they want to make a problem better. Mm -hmm. you know? No, just stick with what God's telling you to say. If God's not telling you to say anything, don't say anything. Amen? But, you know, 
whatever the gifting of prophecy, I guess what I'm saying is every prophecy has a flavor to it. Kind of like you got lemon lime and strawberry and cherry <laughs> snow cones. You know, I'm trying to play, say it as simple as I can. And everybody has a flavor about their prophecy. I mean, if you think about prophecies that pastor gives, there's probably one or two words that you would describe as prophecies. But when you think about Michael, there's one or two words that you might think, you know, Michael is more revival and, and the glory and the power of God. You know, and pastor is, pastor is more pastorly. Not that Michael's not pastorly. But, you know, it's, it, there's just flavors. Yes. You know, you, you listen to, to uh, Larry Huggins prophesy. He's got a whole other flavor to him than Tom Terry. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. People that know who I'm talking about. Yeah. It's different. And that's what I'm saying. So whatever your gifting is, whatever your flavor is, stay with that. Don't try to be a Larry Huggins in Amen. your prophecy. Don't try to be, you know, a Tom Terry or a Kenneth Copeland or Brother Hagen in your prophecy. Be who you are. Be who God, I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying. It uh, says, so prophesy in proportion to your faith, or your, the gifting that's in you, or ministry, let us use it. Our ministry, uh, he who teaches teaching, he who exhorts exhortation, he who gives uh, with liberality, uh, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Don't be a mercy person and, don't be che and not be cheerful about it. Pastor is a mercy person. He can be cheerful about it. There was a situation the other day. I said, boy, you got more mercy than I do. And he says, that's obvious. And because his motivating gift in his life is mercy. He's, he's a mercy guy. He's got a Superman shirt. Prove it. <laughs> I used to say he had sucker tattooed across his back. I, God corrected me. It's mercy. That's right. But, uh, you know, so, so those giftings that God gives you, use them. You know, when you think about the parable of the, of the talents. You know, God gave them talents according to how they functioned with money. He says, well, these guys, these guys are good stewards, so I'm going to give him ten. This guy's okay. I'm going to give him five. This guy has got a learning curve. I'm going to give him one. Yeah. You know? And so, so God, the giftings that God gives us have a. That's the word I want to use. We can develop them in Him to where the capacity is greater. He can, he can let us operate more and more and more in those as we use them. Will you make mistakes? Yeah, you probably make mistakes. You'll probably not have the word of knowledge that you thought you had. You may not, you know, have prophesied spawn on, you know. You might have been out of order at the time, you know, whatever. But see, we're learning. And, and that's why it's so important that we're one as a body because now, now we allow people to function in their gifts and learn how to function in their gifts. Yeah. You know, we, you know, people that want to come up and say, oh, God gave me a word. You know, we as pastors, we have to guard that. And if we, and if we feel that person's trustworthy and the timing's right or whatever, we go ahead and let them do that. If the timing's wrong, we say, that sounds like God to me, but the timing's wrong, just wait. And we've had people that we've told that that just left the service. They got offended. Mm -hmm. No, we weren't putting you down. We were just saying, we've been given stewardship over this atmosphere as pastors, and we're saying that the timing's not right. Yeah, it's God, but the timing's not right. Just hang on. Mm -hmm. And the ones that stay, you know, pastor will say, come up and give that word, you know, whatever it was, when the time is right. So we're all learning. Yeah. I tell you, we, we've had to, we failed and succeeded time and time again in ministry. And, you know, sometimes we don't know we failed or we messed up, you know, until we get down the road. But you can't quit because you, I mean, you didn't quit walking because you fell down the first time. You didn't quit riding bicycles because you skinned your knees once. Mm -hmm. No, you got up and you just kept going. The first time I ever prophesied, I got shut down by the pastor. 
You know, it was a long time before I ever prophesied again. Because the devil used that one on me big time. It wasn't me. It was time. <laughs> I would have just overrode him. <laughs> that would, uh, we're, we're learning that lesson too. But um, but just but you hear what I'm saying. We we're all growing together. You know. And yeah, do we do make mistakes? Yeah, we do. Do we flub up? Yeah, we do. But see, that shouldn't make any difference here. That's right. Because we're family. We need one another. Yes. You know, we, we need to fail in a friendly atmosphere, not a hostile atmosphere. Yeah. Some churches are hostile atmospheres. Yeah. Believe me, I've been in some. <laughs> you know, they, they shoot their wounded. <laughs> When somebody falls down, they kick them while they're down. Probably five or six good old Pentecostal mamas just kick them while they're down. I've seen it. But in Jesus' name, this is going to not be that true. Amen. Amen. We're going to love one another. We're going to depend on one another yes. to pray for us. There's, there's times that, that, that I might be struggling and I'll say, Oh, God, have Joseph. Have Norma pray for me. Or, you know, I might even text him or call him. You know. Because I need them. Yeah. I need you. You need me. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you like me or not, you need me. Yeah. We need one another. We're dependent. The Bible says, we just read there, that we're dependent on one another. Amen. Because I need what's in you. Yeah. You need what's in me. Yeah. You need what's in this place. Yeah. God's put you here for a reason. He's put you with this company for a reason. It's because of the gifts and the callings that are upon this company. And there's nothing wrong with any other church in this town. They have their own company. They have their own calling. They have their, they have their own giftings and anointings that they're going to flow in. And as they hook up with the Believer's Church and they hook up with New Life Assembly and they hook up with Good News and they hook up with Valley West and we begin to hook up as Madeira, as the church of Madeira in this town, the synergism. Yes. Oh my God, if one us in a thousand of like two us in ten thousand, what will five thousand do? Amen. There's no devil in hell can stay in this place. Amen. And we learn to depend upon one another. Yes. yes. We're not foolish, but we learn to depend upon one another. You know, we learn who we can depend upon. We learn who we can call upon to pray for us. Yes. And 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 we're long suffering with the little ones. Yeah. The immature ones. Amen. We had a little gal. I'm gonna close with this. We had a little gal that came into the church. We were on G Street, and uh, this little guy had no church background at all, and so she didn't dress exactly modestly, appropriately. She didn't. Uh, and she just got excited about the Lord. And of course, we didn't have a whole lot of room over there on G Street if you were over there with us. But she'd just dance and dance and dance. And some of you probably know what I'm talking about. She'd dance, and I'd, 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 I'd hear the people, you know, and I'm thinking. And I even had a few say, can't you do something about her? I said, no way. No way. We just keep loving her and keep teaching her, you know. And, 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 and she'll grow up into what God has for her. And she stayed around a long time, you know. And she got offended at some things and, and went on. And, but she still loves the Lord. She still, you know, goes to church and that kind of thing. But she lost her zeal. And I would venture to say that some of that was working it from the things, words working against her, not for her. And I said, God, never let that happen again. Never let that happen again. I know how to handle it a little bit differently this time. But, you know, we never, when the young ones come in, and I'm saying this ahead of time. Yep. When the young ones come in, they're not going to smell like you. They're not going to look like you. You know, we have them come in off the street all the time. And, and you know, we had one little gal come in. I said I'd close with that other story. But <laughs> Forgive me. We had one little gal come in and she came in and she was dressed real scantily. And she says, Oh, she says, I just I feel the love and the peace of God here, but she says, I can't stay here. I'm just not dressed nice. 
And I said, honey, you don't worry about it. We'll just get you a cloth you can put across your lap. You just stay here and let the Spirit of God minister to you. And, and you know, we, we helped her get on the bus at the end of the service and gave her some money to, to go on down the road. And, you know, she was the first one out of all the people we helped. She lived down near Palmdale, some Palm, yeah, Palmdale, Lancaster area. She sent us a letter back. Wow. And I kept it because she said, you don't know what that did to me. She says, I'm back in church serving God. I moved wow. back with my mom. Amen. And I got a job, and I'm doing really good, and I just want to thank Praise you for that. I'll tell you what, they're not going to smell like you, they're not going to dress like you, they're not going to look like you, they're not going to sound like you. They may not even have a clue of what's going on. And they might even be distracted, and they have been. But if we just keep, we correct them in love, we set them back down, you know, we just love them and help them, they'll be back. Amen. And they'll just keep coming back. I can tell you people, there, some of them aren't here tonight. I'd call them my name if they were here. But, you know, Brian, Brian King that comes here, he got, he got out of prison and they let him off at the bus stop. He came into this place. The word just lit him up. He started just volunteering, doing stuff in, around the church. Before you know it, he's got an apartment. He's got a, he's got a job. Yeah, that's right. He's, <laughs> he's got two now. He's doing good. He's got two now. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why? Because somebody loved him. Yeah. Bill. And I see that about yeah. him. He's been working for me the last that's the best guy ever worked. I'm telling you. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I pay him, I mean I don't do it for nothing, but I, that guy and, and I'm I'm telling you that he's just a different person. He's, he's just yeah. a wonderful guy. Yeah. And he's got a lot of going for him right now and he's yeah, he gonna does. be a lot more of him. Amen. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm telling you, they know the love of God. And if we'll just stay with them, God will do that to... I mean, there's some of them that aren't going to have the mindset to do that. Some of these people that come in here have some really mental problems. Yeah. They really need mental help. Yeah. And we can't do a whole lot with them but love them and pray for them and, and you know, do what we can for them. But, but, you know, you never know who's going to walk in that door. Brian didn't have to walk in this door that night. Now he's a vital part. He's gone through membership. He helps on Thursday with the food ministry. Yep. You know? It, see how nice and lit it is in here? Yeah. He changed like 16 bulbs out the other day. Yeah. I know. And John Castro. Help the ladder. Help the It's a pastor's job to keep him falling. Keep him steady. But I'm telling you, if we'll all get in our place, first of all, present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Let God do in us what he needs to do in us. Spend time with him. Let his, let his word renew our thinking. And we begin to function in the things that God, don't try to function in somebody else's ministry. Function in what God's telling you to do. And you begin to function in that. You begin to, uh, begin to go out beyond yourself and function out here in the world keeping yourself connected with the body of Christ that God has sent you to, and I'm telling you what, you're going to see great and mighty things. Oh, yeah. 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 See, this in here is for you and God and everybody that's in this building, but it doesn't stop here. That's right, that's right. When we go out there, we should, we should never be ashamed of praying for somebody. I would, we went to a funeral the other day, and this, this guy was standing there, he worked for the cemetery, he was waiting for everybody to leave so he could bury Sister Leroy. And he was standing there, and he just struck up a conversation with me, and because I had stood away and sit, because I could sit down under a shade tree, and and, and uh, he started talking to me, and he just started pouring his life out to me, and all the things he was going through, and lost his grandmother that had practically raised him, and not he was going all this stuff, you know, and before I left, you know, I said, can I pray with you before I leave, right there in the cemetery. <laughs> My all the dead people. <laughs> you know, pray in Walmart parking lot in Walmart. <laughs> you know, wherever you have the opportunity to take the gifts and the graces that are in you and put them in somebody else to help them. Oh my goodness, we can change this city in less than a year. If you'll just function what God's grace to say. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you and we praise you tonight for your word. We thank you for how great you are. God, you're, you are beyond comprehension how great you are. 
And Father, we just thank you and we praise you. God, I stand before a group of people that have gifts and callings in them. God, that have been calling from the deep for a long time. And God, I thank you and I praise you that you begin to stir in them. Father, the gifts and the callings you've put in them. God, begin to help them see them and begin to help them release them into this community, Father yes. God. And Father God, I thank you that they'll find that time with you is so rich and so deep and just wild at times because of the things you share with them, the things you show them. Father God, and I thank you and I praise you that that time with you begins to show on their face, begins to show in their actions. God, you just show up all over them in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you and I praise you that we are a church reaching the world. God, I thank you that we're able to reach our community. We're able to touch the lives of even those that are in this building. Father, you are so good and so kind. And God, I just worship you. I thank you for the gifts, the many facet gifts that are on the inside of us. God, I thank you that as you shine on us, God, we just glitter in this world, Father God. We just sparkle in this world with your light and your glory. And God, I thank you that we are history changers. We are uh, history makers. And Father God, I just thank you and I praise you for what you're doing in this body. And God, what you're doing in every body, every company, every church that's in this town. And Father, we thank you and we honor you, sir, for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I believe the Lord has given me a, a prophetic song I'm going to just share with you right now. Doorways of utterance. Doorways of utterance stand open to you now. Go forth and go through them, and you won't have to plow. But you'll walk on a highway that I've provided that is true, and you'll see my way, and you'll know what to do. The blessings of the Lord upon you shall come as you learn to walk in my way and by faith you learn to run. The people are waiting. They're standing there now wanting you, looking for you to show them how. So go through the door that I put before you this week. Go through it, says the Lord. Be humble, be meek. Don't stand back in pride and try to decide what you want to do. But you just humble yourself and bow your knee before me, and I will lead you. And many things will happen. People's lives will be changed. I'll come, I'll work, I'll rearrange. And you'll see in your life that even many things will be changed. Because I'll cause you to come into a new place I have for you. Yes, says the Lord, this is exactly what I want to do. Thank you, Father. Now, uh, what is the doorway of utterance? It's an open door to speak to someone. It's an open door to speak to someone. It's an open door to speak to someone. The Father God prompted Jesus to go through a village one day, a village that Jews wouldn't go through because Samaritans lived there and the Jews were racially prejudiced against the Samaritans. They considered them dogs. But the Holy Spirit didn't consider them dogs. He doesn't consider anybody a dog. And he led Jesus and he met a woman and she wasn't exactly the uh, most virtuous of women either. But listen to me. He met her and God opened up a door of utterance for him. The Holy Spirit had him ask her a question. Give me some water from the well, from Jacob's well. And you know the story, you read it. How that this conversation went on and then the gifts of the Spirit got involved and Jesus began to tell her her history by the Holy Ghost. And she goes, whoa, you must be a prophet. She recognized the supernatural. She tried to get him into a, a, a scriptural or a, or a religious discussion and even an argument. He, he uh, just answered a few of her questions. Bottom line, he went through that door of utterance and the whole village got saved. Isn't that what happened? Yeah, that's right. 
God's telling us tonight. He's gifted us. He's empowered us. He wants to work through us. And if you'll just, you know, people are, and this is something he keeps telling me time and time again to tell people. People are trying to get their lives fixed. They're trying to get their body healed. They're trying to get their bank account with money in it. They're trying to get their kids back on track. All the things that need to be fixed in you personally or in your life, it's all going to be fixed in the will, plan, and purpose of God in your life. When you go to be a blessing, you are going to receive blessings. When you go and you say, Lord, today I'm here. Open the door. Let me be a blessing. Let me minister to somebody. Let me talk to somebody. Pray for somebody. Whatever it is, as you go do your ministry, God's going to see to it that everything in your life is taken care of. Jesus said it in Matthew 6. It's in more than one place in the Bible. So cross over. We talked about that this morning. Cross over into that place. Amen. Let's stand. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your people tonight. Yes. I thank you that they are salt and light. Yes. And as they go out this door tonight and go into the community, you're going to set up divine appointments for them. Yeah. The angels during worship tonight were released to go and start setting things up, bringing divine appointments, causing them to cross the path of people uh, this week. So that those people can be saved, healed, encouraged, strengthened, blessed financially. However you want to use us. But Lord, I thank you that this is a week of harvest. This is a week of taking ground. This is a week of your people being a blessing. Letting those gifts and anointings flow through them to the people this week. And that your kingdom, Father, is established in Madeira because of it. We thank you for it. And we go to serve you this week in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great week. CJ's.